and thank you for attending today's threat post webinar entitled Data Security in the Cloud, How to Lock Down Data When the Traditional Network Perimeter is No Longer in Place. I'm Tara Seal, Senior Editor at Threat Post, and I'll be your moderator today. I'm excited to welcome our panelists um, who will give a pretty comprehensive dive into cloud security, um, which is a topic I think on most people's minds and business these days. Um, uh, to that end, let me introduce them. We are going to hear today from, um, from Jim Rebus, who is CEO at the Cloud Security Alliance, as well as Sean Cordero, who is VP of Cloud Strategy at Netscope, and uh, he's here in his uh, capacity as a member of the Cloud Security Alliance today. Um, and I wanted to let you guys know that, uh, so they're going to run through a presentation, and then after that, we're going to have a panel discussion and a Q&A session with you, our audience members. Um, you can submit your questions at pretty much any time during the webinar using the control panel widget on the right-hand side of your screen. If you look, there's an option for questions, and you can click on that to open up a window where you can submit your queries. Um, speaking of which, I have a couple of housekeeping notes before we begin. First of all, uh, the webinar is being recorded, so we'll be sending out a link where you can listen on demand, so you can share that with your colleagues. Um, we're also going to eventually have a transcript and video posted on threatpost.com, so you can keep an eye out for that. Um, and with that, uh, before we get started, uh, I also wanted to just briefly frame our discussion and talk a little bit about why this topic uh, is so timely or why we think it's so timely. Um, you know, for one, businesses are embracing on-demand and software as a service SaaS applications at a rapid clip. Um, I think you know we're, we're aware of that. Uh, small businesses might have only three or four applications, but Fortune 500 companies might have literally thousands of cloud applications. So, um, you know, this is something that is uh, definitely unavoidable. Um, and on top of that, businesses are adding infrastructure as a service and cloud storage to the network footprint. They're connecting to those resources using a vast set of, of new and um, different types of devices, both uh, mobile and fixed, uh, that may or may not be located within a company branch or, or headquarters. Um, and the result is that you have a lot of uh, data flying around. You have both structured and unstructured data. Um, it can be either at rest in some kind of cloud repository or flying back and forth between uh, endpoints and various services. And all of that's spread out against um, across multiple parts of the corporate architecture, um, some parts of which the business might manage or own themselves, and other parts they might not have a whole lot of oversight um, on because it's hosted in the cloud. So you end up with a fragmented landscape where a lot of the control and visibility that organizations have traditionally enjoyed over their data has kind of gone away. Um, and that, in turn, introduces risk and new areas of risk um, where the concerns that, that people should maybe be thinking about aren't necessarily that well known. Um, so uh, Jim and Sean are going to cover this ground today, and I'm really excited to hear what they have to say. Um, and uh, they're going to give us some ideas and best practices for, for locking down data across this uh, new cloud-enabled architecture. Um, so with that, I'm going to turn it over uh, to these guys. Uh, welcome, Jim and Sean. Thank you for joining us. Pleasure to be here. And uh, Thank you for having that, I, I'd love it if you guys could uh, introduce yourselves and, and tell us a little bit about um, uh, what you're bringing to the table today. Sure, I'll, I'll go first. Hi, this is uh, Jim Rivas. Uh, so I started in uh, information security in a bank 1988 doing some computer security. And obviously the world has changed quite a bit. Uh, I've always enjoyed being in this uh, industry because it's a very interesting, thoughtful combination of art and science where you have the technology, you also have adversaries, you have the psychology of, of the organizations to be thinking about. And uh, I started Cloud Security Alliance, started thinking about it in 2007, 2008, when you were starting to see this as a coming trend and a lot of virtualization, just a lot of very virtualized view of the world. And so we are now uh, 10 years old and have uh, done a lot of work in terms of as a nonprofit doing the vendor neutral types of research best practices certification for providers as well as uh, individuals and just happy to be here and we'll try to share as much of uh, what i have have learned over those 31 years that might be relevant to the topic great thank you 
Nimshan, what about you? Hi, this is uh, Sean Cordero. Um, thank you again, everyone, for joining us for today's conversation. Um, I've been in the IT and security space now going on uh, 21 years, which is longer than I <laughs> like to admit. Um, grew up coming up as a network engineer, architect, uh, really focusing on uh, trying to solve for uh, the risk management puzzle as it related to uh, international and, and global risk uh, at the company that I serve. One of the key uh, things that uh, led to my engagement with the Cloud Security Alliance uh, was uh, the acknowledgement that uh, there was an inadequate amount of guidance uh, from uh, other organizations that then led me to the CSA, uh, where I've been uh, a contributor to uh, some of their core research uh, specifically the cloud controls matrix and the consensus assessments initiative questionnaire. And I can't believe I didn't stumble saying that. Um, happy to be here. Looking forward to the conversation. I'm hopeful that uh, we get folks on the phone are able to uh, glean something from it and ask questions as well. Great. Well, thank you guys. Appreciate it. And uh, with that, Sean, I'm going to turn it over to you. I know you're going to be running the, the slides today, and you and Jim are both going to tag team on this presentation. I'm excited to, to hear what you guys have to say, and uh, over to you. Great. Thank you very much. Can uh, you see this deck? Good to go. Yep. Excellent. So as we've uh, already introduced ourselves, I'll move uh, past this. Um, for the next uh, 25 to 30 minutes or so, um, there's going to be a lot of content that we're going to uh, to be sharing. Uh, one of the key things that we really want to uh, encourage everyone is to please ask questions. Uh, we want to keep this interactive. Um, and at the same time, uh, if there's something that uh, you feel you agree or do not agree with, please uh, let's have discourse and dialogue. I think that's how we all get better. So uh, for the next uh, 25, 30 minutes or so, uh, give you an overview of what the core drivers of the cloud adoption are and why it is that uh, it seems to have kind of gone out of control from a uh, IT risk management perspective. Uh, we'll talk about some very specific and uh, troublesome uh, cloud risks that uh, some organizations may or may not know about. And uh, then we'll provide some recommendations, high level as a starting point in terms of trying to get ahead of the inevitable uh, adoption of, of, of cloud-based technologies. And then, of course, uh, we'll move forward with a discussion. So at about 2012, Harvard Business Review, in conjunction with, uh, I believe it was Verizon at the time, um, did a study. And what they found was that uh, this cloud adoption thing was uh, moving pretty quickly and much faster than anyone had anticipated. And in 2012, what they said is um, organizations that are moving towards cloud, um, they will have a competitive advantage in terms of uh, competing in the market. And interestingly enough, three years later, they came back and they did a very similar analysis. And what they found was a bit startling. What they found is that the organizations that had not adopted cloud um, or had no plans for cloud adoption had actually lagged significantly behind and fallen uh, down from a competitive standpoint. So cloud literally from their analysis has become table stakes for most business leaders simply due to the agility and speed and uh, capability that, that it provides. That also has been echoed with some of the top leaders in the cloud space where, you know, Mark Benninghoff, the uh, founder and CEO of Salesforce, uh, has said on multiple occasions that uh, this is really the next uh, evolution and revolution in terms of how we work uh, and interact with data, how we interact with process, and ultimately how we empower businesses. So when we think about our, our push to digital transformation and, and, and what it means from a um, security and risk management standpoint, there's some really tough truths that uh, I think we as secu the security industry and even as security practitioners have had to uh, face directly or indirectly, but now I think cloud and cloud adoption has really forced 
um, and expose a lot of the weaknesses that have existed um, across the information and cyber landscape. Uh, we all know that breaches keep going up, et cetera, et cetera. But one of the things that rarely gets asked is, well, if we're getting better at security, why is the problem seeming to get worse? And uh, part of, and I'm speaking simply from my, my uh, point of view, I don't actually think uh, security as a practice was something that uh, IT and cyber were really that good at to begin with. And I'm, and I'm painting with a very broad brush here, partly due to the fact that some of the things that we all struggle with as uh, cybersecurity pros, they're really fundamental, basic things that uh, often don't even fall within the purview of cyber. For example, you have organizations that will spend inordinate amount of time in, on managing vulnerabilities, some of them on developed applications or other cases just simply getting a patch management process in place. And that becomes sometimes like a multi-month, multi-year effort, and often it never really gets to where it wants to be. But now, since a lot of that responsibility has kind of been pushed out to the cloud, um, you still have, as the cyber professional, a responsibility to ensure that not only do you understand what your provider is providing you, but really the crux of this discussion, which is what is it that you can effectuate from a controls perspective? And that's kind of the crazy part because what we found is that the great majority of organizations that are saying, hey, we're doing a cloud move or a cloud migration, they actually uh, may or may not know, or often I think they know, but uh, kind of avoid that discussion because it's difficult, that really the great majority of cloud usage is already in their enterprise. And it's not under the control of anyone um, in that organization. So that creates uh, immediate friction because as professionals, we get stuck. How is it then that we're going to enable, let's say, our human resources team that is utilizing a uh, software as a service platform to do payroll, but they didn't get it set up via IT, thus it's not set up via single sign-on, it doesn't utilize some of the basic controls that cyber might want. How is it then that we come in as uh, risk management professionals and tell them that they can't use it anymore? And that immediately puts us at odds, and always has, but in the modality of cloud-based access, it's even worse because there's nothing we can do to really prohibit it from the get-go outside of some architectural things. But the risks are really the same, right? I mean, this is, this is the issue which makes it so complex, is that we've had management and risk management models and cyber technical control models that have been in existence for a solid 30 years um, and I've always kind of questioned the efficacy of those anyways, um, but now we're trying to apply them into uh, the cloud context where all of these components are really completely different. And this is where we start looking at the, the core challenges, which is there's a lot, and I believe Jim will be speaking to this about the shared responsibilities and the scope in more detail uh, a little further on here, but one of the things that is uh, very troubling is uh, within the cloud service providers, and, and I understand why uh, from a business standpoint and also from a supportability standpoint, additional features that might be necessary to provide uh, data protection um, or uh, reduce management of or overhead associated with risk management are often requiring uh, the consumer of the service to pay extra for it, which is fascinating because a lot of the CSPs will also in the same breath speak about how deep and wide the security capabilities are. But therein we have another challenge, which is, <clears throat> and the CSA many years ago, and I believe Jim, um, the open shared API initiative um, that uh, the CSA was driving as a research project. One of the, uh, one of the ideas that uh, CSA had brought to the industry was, why don't we create a uniform set of application programming interfaces that can then be leveraged across uh, the entirety of the space? And uh, maybe Jim, you can speak to how well that was received. Uh, I can certainly speak to what I've seen in terms of the adoption of something like that. 
Sure, I, I think that there's an aspect of how we how we do security or how we think about IT in general is somewhat idealistic that we can create a, a, a massive amount of standards that allow uh, the, a maximum amount of flexibility. And the idea in the open APIs uh, pro working group project was to allow uh, an, a certain modicum of portability from a consumer perspective, and that could be an enterprise consumer, to be able to securely manage encrypt information to a variety of different cloud providers. And you don't necessarily see things happen that way. And from a cloud provider perspective, we, we've seen them innovate to, to compete with each other to provide a lot of unique services. Those unique services could be considered proprietary and you could say that's proprietary in a good way. So it's continuing back and forth that I think we have that we need to sort of manage to understand. It is going to be a complex environment and we can try to advocate and the, the consumers of cloud can try to insist that their providers adhere to standards that allow you to, for example, bring your own keys to a, any cloud provider, which is something we advocate quite a bit and it's been in our guidance, but it, it really is a, a challenge and it's, it's probably foolish to think we are going to have such a level of cooperation on all the different cloud providers that it's so easy to move applications and data between them seamlessly and so we can always strive towards that but we, we need to understand it's continued to grow in complexity yeah that, that's great insights and, and you know to everyone on the phone um jim made a very critical point there which is the cloud consumers i.e your enterprises really need to drive uh the need for that by requesting it and forcing your uh, csps to engage with your other partners. Because uh, what's, what's happened is not only are certain security features, in some cases, behind paywalls, um, there is no parity around this, which then leads to a really complex problem. Um, back in the day when uh, single sign-on was first introduced, everyone was like, this is great. We would love to expand this elsewhere. And it did create a boom in terms of internal effective uh, efficacy and efficiency for IT and security teams. However, uh, in the cloud model, that is at a minimum table stakes to having some sort of identity provider. But what isn't solved for is the fact, and it's tied to the first portion, that uh, the fact is that if you need to create uh, security policies, let's say data protection policies on one cloud or data protections on another cloud, you're forced to log into each one of these clouds independently and configure them. Now, I grew up as a Windows administrator as well, and I remember how difficult it was just to get the correct uh, folder rights um, set up for a share. Now, imagine trying to get the folder rights on a SaaS service and then ensuring that the SaaS service is configured in a secure manner on top of which, hopefully you're paying for the additional security features that actually enable you to do more control. So it's kind of like this uh, vicious cycle that we're finding ourselves in. And I think this is where uh, we as practitioners and uh, folks that consume cloud services really need to uh, engage with the CSPs to, to rethink this because I don't believe it's going to be a model that's going to uh, do the right thing for uh, our organizations. And then because the vendors are limited, um, it creates a lot of friction for our end users and the folks that really are getting the most benefit from, from the usage. So some of the key things that lead to very specific uh, cloud risks that are tied to uh, the data protection piece, and some organizations may or may not be aware of this. Uh, I know in my other capacity, um, this is a conversation that we talk about a lot. So we've already discussed the fact that, uh, you know, the business organizations, uh, those are your lines of business, your sales teams, your marketing teams, uh, your human resources team, which is ironic, actually, one thing. Um, the top two organizations within almost any enterprise that tend to adopt cloud fastest and often 
can create exposure because maybe they're not engaging with uh, security. Uh, in our research shows that it's human resources and marketing where those two uh, lines of business tend to kind of switch back and forth. And part of it is because uh, they, they may perceive that the usage of a particular cloud, uh, irrespective of how quote unquote secure it is, um, isn't really in the purview of IT because unlike in the past, where they would have to call somebody and say, can I get this deployed? Can I do this? Can I do that? That is not a uh, process or workflow that exists in the cloud context. It doesn't have to exist because by definition, it's meant to work that way. So that leads to a variety of other issues as well. So one of the key things is that you know, we kind of ignore the fact that this data is doing this now. Um, a lot of organizations are still trying to uh, go down the path of uh, home running architecturally, everything back down to their on-premises, uh, you know, security stack. But what very quickly occurs is that uh, when you have this architecture that really wasn't that effective to begin with, if you really think about it, um, one of the key things that uh, a lot of organizations are dealing with is the, the pervasiveness of phishing attacks. And uh, I don't know if everyone kind of recalls why some of those attacks became so prevalent early on and why uh, organizations uh, were so subjected or, and uh, weak to them. It was because it was a very effective way to uh, bypass all of the traditional you know, network controls because the trust model in and of itself, where anything coming out from your network going to the internet is considered to be safe, um, phishing like attacks, command and control type uh, attacks uh, exploit that. And um, sadly, you know, the, the technology kind of in place right now can't really handle that. So what we end up with is this is one of the, the, the really uh, scary parts and something that, uh, you know, I work with a lot of organizations on talking about is this. If we think about this gate as your, I'm going to use a firewall as an example. It could also be your proxy. If we say, hey, um, we want to prohibit organization, our enterprise from going to bad sites. So those might be work inappropriate sites, uh, potentially illegal sites, or even uh, storage services like uh, that are not cleared by IT or cyber or risk. Um, traditionally, the way this gets handled is you'll uh, put some rules in place on your firewall going outbound or put some rules in place on your proxy going outbound. And then you'll kind of call it good and you leave it to the, the, the vendor to kind of say, yes, this is a good site, this is a bad site. But back to the, the, the issue that I brought up before, because of the lack of openness in terms of standards uh, for the uh, integration with existing security tools and other net new tools that might come into existence, you end up with a situation where um, simply by enabling these services, uh, outbound through your enterprise, you're actually having an implicit and sometimes explicit uh, acceptance of risk. And that risk acceptance looks like uh, one of your end users intentionally or unintentionally uh, taking your data on one of your devices that you are responsible for and moving it to a different tenant on that same cloud. And what happens then is, is that your traditional controls do not have any way of prohibiting that because the only way to traditionally block that would be uh, through some, some level of, uh, of acknowledgement that uh, it's going to a different instance. And the way that a lot of these technologies work, it doesn't do that. So this is where uh, one example of by the consumer can um, really drive that discussion because for me as a practitioner who's very passionate about this, that to me is an unacceptable risk. I could never go to my uh, executive vice presidents and say, hey, just so you know, we're totally okay with somebody saving all of this sensitive stuff to their home version of Office 365. But this is where we need to you know, really stand with like the CSA and all these other organizations to force that discussion between our security vendors, our, uh, our cloud service providers, to get us all in a healthier place to address things like this, that uh, right now there, there is no way 
uh, to easily address this. So when we think about uh, this whole data exo piece and how it goes, one of the key things that happens quite regularly is that if you think of the kill chain and you say, well, um, how does it actually change in cloud? It gets, it gets even a little scarier. And it's unrealistic to say, hey, we're going to just pull back all of the cloud because of, you know, uh, Sean and Jim were talking about the skill chain and we're at high risk because the problems are still effectively the same. It's just a question how you approach it. I'll give you an example. Let's say for a minute that you're utilizing a, a CRM. Your sales team uses a CRM. Insert whomever uh, it may be. Um, it could be one of the leading ones or it could be a startup that nobody knows about. So let's call it, I'm going to call it uh, SeanCRM.com. And now we've got an, a, a bad actor um, that is out there really interested in, in our customer information. And the way that they would have tried to poke and prod the infrastructures in the past, they would have to get a foothold internally, which is fairly trivial with phishing. So I'm not saying that it would have been any better in the on-prem model. In fact, it's probably worse. But um, what they would do in the past is they would sit there, they would do things that were fairly loud and like port scanning, or they would, uh, you know, learn something by gleaning header information. And it was all very rudimentary. But now with cloud, what you can really do is if you know that uh, your organization is utilizing, I don't know, um, this particular CRM, if I'm a bad actor, what all I have to do to start finding ways to potentially attack your instance, your tenant, I simply just need to figure out what the name of the tenant is, which often is your company's name. So for example, let's say it was, you know, um, Marty's cars, you know, dot SeanCRM.com. That's most commonly the naming scheme that's used across all CSPs, where it's your company plus their uh, FQDN at the end. Well, if you know that, now all of a sudden you can start doing something very basic like, hey, let me see if I can figure out how I can log into these things. Well, with that information in hand, what you can then start uh, tailoring um, very specific attacks. So if you want to do spear phishing attacks against uh, senior executives or uh, research folks, you can leverage that knowledge to create highly customized and very difficult to, pro to prohibit and prevent um, delivery mechanisms that look completely uh, legitimate. And because the way that uh, a lot of our technologies have worked, and the fact that our CSPs may or may not be quite where they need to be in terms of their ability to support and protect against these types of things, you end up and get stuck where now you have another vector uh, where your data can actually slip. So let me give you an example of where this actually has, has occurred and continues to occur. Is Let's say that somebody wants to do a, a very specific spear phishing campaign. One way that they will uh, get around all of your controls um, is simply by leveraging the fact that within our architectures, we are trusting um, the final destination of the CSP. So let's say for a minute that you have a cloud service provider that you're engaged with, they're doing data storage for you. Uh, it might be user level, it might be uh, server level, but what you end up with is your machines, i.e. your devices or your mobile devices, do have a kind of implicit trust between that CSP and what you're doing. And usually from a risk management standpoint, um, organizations sign off and say, yeah, of course you can use that. Well, the attackers know this, and what they do instead is when they create their phishing campaigns, they leverage the fact that you are uh, further trusting that CSP. So they will provide a link uh, with a, uh, as part of the spear fish that ties to the same cloud, but it's not against your tenants. So what that ends up happening is when a user gets phished, your uh, swigs, your firewalls, all of that can't do anything to prevent it. And now your user is exposed. And interestingly enough, uh, uh, one of the things that was identified, and there was just another uh, thing that came out just uh, two days ago, is that in addition to which, uh, you're seeing attacks where 
end users are being compromised and subsequently uh, the larger part of the enterprise are being compromised by a combination of um, drive-by infections, which has always been a thing and continue to be a thing, where a, a user's in a browser, they're accessing some site that's got a malicious payload, uh, it, it gets infected, and then from there, um, they leverage the fact to then start feeding you other payloads, leveraging the cloud infrastructures as a repository. And again, because they know that uh, from a detection and control standpoint, there's little that can be done, you end up where uh, not only is it difficult to identify uh, the attack, but in addition to which, uh, it's really difficult, if not impossible in some cases, uh, to pull that back once that's occurred. So with that, um, do we have any questions at the moment from, uh, from the audience, Tara? Hi, Sean. Um, yeah, we do actually have a couple of questions. If you wanted to go ahead and uh, we can maybe field those. Um, so uh, we have a question about, uh, I guess, who is who has a level of oversight over the cloud providers to make sure that they're compliant um, versus just managing risk, I think is what the person is asking. Um, she says that uh, she gets pushback that um, that C is requiring more than other than uh, what other customers are asking for. Um, she's being told that drive encryption is good enough to tick the box, but with multi-tenant, it doesn't ensure that data is protected from other customers, um, especially uh, especially with uh, shared keys and administrators or service accounts that uh, can access all of them. Uh, so she wants to know. Can anyone measure the right level of controls and requirements within a cloud environment? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, Jim, you want to take that one, and I can I can pile on after. Sh sure. So uh, just kind of stepping back to like who governs the cloud and who manages it, it it tends to cut several different ways. Where there's sort of national types of standards and you look at something like FedRAMP for the United States covering the federal government's procurement of cloud based on NIST standards and, and so that's something that you tend to see a lot of alignment even in the private sector for that and so you have that country-based thing. You have uh, maybe industry-based things like PCI for the payment card industry where they've tried to um, adapt some of that and and then you have just regulatory bodies that try to use available standards because technology is moving so quickly it's it's hard to use standards that take years and years to develop and so that's where an organization like cloud security alliance where we move pretty quickly with creating best practices and we map them to a lot of different global standards that are out there that it ends up for an organization that is doing risk management in the cloud they have to understand what are the applicable laws that they need to be dealing with and then they they look at sort of this hybrid approach to take maybe something like the cloud security alliance cloud controls matrix or our star program and how it maps to these different standards to be able to understand what are the different uh, governing um, laws and what are the different standards and how do we sort of bring those all together in a, a risk management program based on what you're doing. In terms of getting more specific to the question about the, have, have people looked at the uh, issues with encryption and the control over shared secrets? We, we've had this in our best practices for, for quite a while that ideally the appropriate way to manage the data is that the the user the tenant the owner in in eu parlance you might say the data controller that they should be managing the keys directly and encrypting the information and ideally you get to a point where the cloud provider is a data processor and they're they're managing the systems but they're not actually managing your data so that's very easy to do in infrastructure as a service in software as a service, that's very difficult to do in how it's implemented today. The uh, the cloud providers, the SaaS providers actually need to be able to manipulate the data to make sure it's correctly backed up and everything else. We're, we're, we're moving to a point where 
that is where we're, I believe we're going to have this sort of hybrid best of both worlds where you bring your own key to do that. So because we, we don't have this perfect world, it becomes very important to look at other indirect controls and say, for example, do they have very good vetting of their employees with this cloud provider? Do they have security clearances? Do they have proper training? Do you have the proper audit trails so that if someone does have physical access to information, do we know that it's being governed properly? So you have to end up looking at a lot of those different things. And, and we would again encourage you to look at their their certifications, the audits that they've had, and and do they align with things like uh, CSX Cloud Matrix and our STAR program? Okay, great. Um, and we do have uh, one more question uh, along those same lines. Um, uh, this person would like to know if uh, there are any independent reports out there that, that you guys are aware of on the security posture of uh, available cloud um, providers, infrastructure providers like Amazon or Azure um, with recommendations on um, who has the better security posture. And you would also like to know if any ethical hackers have, uh, have tackled the question, um, I'm assuming in, in the sense of hunting for bugs. I can take just a quick pass on this and give Sean a chance. I frankly, no, no, this is good. I, 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 program, right? <laughs> frankly, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't trust some report that uh, compared them in a consumer reports fashion and said one or the other is, is better because it is so complex. And what we find is that 80 to 90 percent of the security responsibility remains with the customer. Um, but I'll say this, that on apples to apples for what the major cloud providers do, the tier one cloud providers do in terms of the, the scope of what they're responsible for, they are far better than anyone in the world. Maybe there's a few banks and a few defense uh, departments in different nations that are equivalent, but they do a, a far better job. And that's why cloud can be very secure, but most of the responsibility is, is on your side. So I would look at how they all answer the different um, compliance questionnaires, but you have to turn inward and say, how am I using it? What are the different applications I'm gonna be using? And then say this from a risk management perspective, this is, this is the right solution, but com comparing an AWS to Azure uh, to a, a Google Cloud Platform, if we're talking about the, the big US-based ones, they are all uh, a order of magnitude better than what any typical customer would be able to do on their own for apples to apples. Got it, thank you. Um, okay, and let's, let's tackle uh, one more and before you get back to the presentation, if that's okay. Um, we had another question that uh, this, this person wants to know, how can one ensure that the cloud provider is not commingling uh, your data and that uh, it's being deleted from backups and, and temporary or redundant copies are being uh, eliminated um, as, you know, as, as requested? Is there any way to, to kind of keep tabs on that? Sean, do you want to answer this one? Yeah, I, I can take that one. Um, the, the, the answer is the honor system. Um, and that's kind of what we're what we're, we as an industry, are, I think, are at a crossroads, right? Where, um, much like the the other two questions, because to me these are all interrelated and hitting on the same problem. And I'm going to jump ahead to one other slide here, really quick, because this is what I was going to chat about. We'll, we'll come back to the other piece because it's all interrelated to the last three questions. Where Jim stated. Um, very clearly, and I 100% agree, that uh, the majority of the responsibility in the shared responsibility model still falls on the, on the customer. And what I think has been happening is there has been an over-focus um, as a, I think it's actually as a response to the ineffectiveness of being able to effectuate risk in the cloud i.e., uh, Jim mentioned, uh, you know, bring your own key. Well, if we think about that, that's such an obvious, necessary thing, but why is it so difficult for the CSPs to support it? Well, it's because they never coded it that way. And until the market demands, i.e., office practitioners, that they enable these types of things, 
um, it's always going to be a whack-a-mole in terms of the controls that are necessary to really secure your, your data. So one of the things that occurs um, in this situation is really this idea of understanding the controls and the gaps of the cloud service provider. But I don't see it from the perspective of, hey, uh, AWS is, you know, they don't do this one thing, and thus we're going to move down that direction away from them because they don't need such and such control. Now, in some cases, that's totally appropriate. In other cases, uh, it may not even be that meaningful because really where the majority of the risk continues to, rely, to, to, to reside is on the consumer. So if we think about where a lot of us right now are probably standing up third-party risk management or cloud governance uh, uh, programs, right? Um, I actually believe that, uh, in no disrespect to anyone that's doing this, but just having done it and seen the end result of it, I actually think it's kind of a huge waste of time in the long term. The reason is, is because um, if you ultimately come down to a conversation with your CSP where you've identified a control deficiency that for whatever reason is critical to you conducting business, your only way of effectuating change there is either A, if it's a bug that they acknowledge and they can fix. Second piece is whether or not, if it's not a bug, it's just a lack of a feature, if you can convince them to create uh, and add that feature, i.e. it's got to go into their CI, CD pipeline and it's got to be prioritized just like, just like our IT teams have to except they're doing with a much larger scale. And they're gonna be a little more risk averse. Why? Because if they make a change to something like that, that is going to be across the board, it may have uh, significant uh, negative impacts across all of their clients or against everyone that they're serving. So they tend to kind of slow roll some of that stuff. Um, and then third is that you end up now then asking these questions over and over again. Do you have this? Do you have that? And now what they've done, and um, a lot of this is, is great because the CSA has uh, been leading this whole thing for some time now, is giving a contextualized view through reporting via like the CSA's cloud controls matrix or the assessments initiatives questionnaire or via STAR certification that actually gives you a higher level of assurance that uh, they are doing the right thing. So one of the questions that was asked is, where can I get a sense of where, um, you know, kind of where the cloud providers reside, like kind of where they stand? Um, Jim made a good point that it's so difficult to assess them from the, from the outside in and then back out that uh, I would say that the, the best resource uh, that you will find is going to be at the Cloud Security Alliance via the, their STAR registry. The STAR registry has uh, the same types of questionnaires that our teams are all going out and asking um, our vendors for. And uh, those are pre-answered in many cases by the leading CSPs. So then you have an initial starting point to kind of assess them. But then again, it comes back to, well, how much time will you spend as a risk practitioner assessing these CSPs over and over again when really your only levers are going to be during your negotiation, i.e. of a contract, post-issue that's related to a bug or a failure of service, so you might have a little bit of leverage, and then third, uh, the threat of a lawsuit of you walking away. Now, those are not very good options for us as security practitioners to try to get capability added. So if you really think about it, then it all comes back down to either a ticket that gets submitted or it comes down to a contractual slash legal conversation for which, uh, you know, we as practitioners may or may not be, may or may not be part of because that's going to go potentially to litigation if, if something bad happens because of it. So that's why I, I kind of say not that glibly that we spend so much time trying to assess how well they do it. Meanwhile, um, I've seen organizations that they literally have like a staff of three or four people doing this full time across all of the vendors with an overt focus on the, on the CSPs. Meanwhile, they're not even looking at their procurement process to understand how 
Is this, how is somebody in development going and spinning up a $10,000 a month AWS instance? How is it getting expensed? Why does that happen? These are the things that actually cause the greater exposure and the greater risk, as opposed to focusing just on what the CSP is or isn't doing, specifically in the context that you really can't effectuate it, at least not directly. I mean, perhaps the Fortune Global Five might have the ability to pull those types of levers, but you're talking about, you know, potentially hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars of spend where a CSP would then perk up their ears and go, okay, let's talk about this, right? I don't know about you guys, but at least for me, we don't have that kind of budget uh, to be able to spend that much on a CSP. So we end up kind of having to go down the contractual, you know, route. Now, there was another question that was asked, which is around how do I ensure that uh, this data isn't being commingled? What I would suggest is um, have your, um, your technical teams, your architecture teams work with, because um, often the way that the, the CSPs will engage with you, they'll have like a salesperson and they'll have like a pre-sales engineer of some kind. Fairly typical in our industry. But there's always an additional level of engineering knowledge that exists outside of the, the infield teams. I would suggest engaging your uh, architects that understand cloud architecture. Hopefully you have those, and if not, you know, it's a good opportunity to engage and, and learn a couple of things. Um, and really help have them help you decompose and understand how it is they do things. Um, I think what ends up happening is that uh, because of the lack of, you know, cloud being effectively a black, black box in most cases, um, we end up in a situation where we say, oh, well, that um, can't be good, so we shouldn't do it. And it may turn out that it's actually quite great, but perhaps we haven't asked the right questions. So to, to find out the answer of whether or not they're you're commingling data, if you asked a CSP uh, seller, you know, somebody that is selling you Amazon and his or her engineer uh, is telling you to go, oh yeah, of course we don't do that. And they may be giving you a legitimate uh, and correct answer, but I don't know about you, that wouldn't be good enough for me. I would want to know more. Um, just so I would feel better about it. Um, and that's where I think you, it, it requires partnership and deep engagement with the CSP. Got it. Okay, great, thank you. Um, okay, so I, you know, we're, we're uh, about 10 minutes away from reaching the, the, our time limit here. Um, so did you, wanna, did you wanna quickly run through the rest of your slides and then maybe we can uh, field uh, one or two more questions before we wrap? Sure. Uh, Jim, did you want to speak a little bit about the, the cloud security focus? I know we jumped ahead a little bit there, but I think it was a good discussion. Yeah, that, that's not a problem. So what I want the audience with this slide to understand is sort of how you should strategically view uh, your responsibilities in securing your organization. So. NIST came up with a cloud definition years ago, and what you'll see on the left there in that layered model, CSA took the NIST definition of cloud infrastructure, platform, software as a service, and the different deployment models, and we had it visualize this layered model to say that software as a service resides on top of platform, resides on top of infrastructure as a service, and, and what that should mean to you is when you're engaging the most applications and providers you're dealing with, it, they actually exist as a mashup of several different companies and services. So it's important to understand that. And then the the idea with the, the inverted pyramid is that you're actually going to have in software as a service, a large number, thousands of SaaS applications that are going to be residing on just a small number of infrastructure providers. We've already mentioned a few of who those are. And also, you might be developing your own applications if you are engaging directly with some of those major cloud providers. So the things that you should understand is, is that vetting for procuring and managing means you're going to have a large number of SaaS applications. You're going to have a smaller amount of time that you're going to be able to vet their suitability and their security practices. And you're going to have a smaller number of infrastructure providers that you are going to have the responsibility because they make those pretty open platforms. It's your job to actually implement 
the security controls when you're using that. So what you should be thinking about on the top right, the shared responsibility, is the fact that if you are engaging directly with infrastructure as a service, it's the raw compute, it's the virtualization, it's the containerization, that you it's mostly the consumer, the tenant, the data controller to actually implement the security program. And it's, as I was saying, 80% of the security controls. If it's a software as a service, it's a fully baked business application, it's mostly going to be the provider implementing the controls and then your job becomes more of the audit perspective. So implement technical security if it's infrastructure and do the audit vendor procurement stuff if it's SaaS. And there's a little bit of exceptions there, like you wanna have a very strong identity management infrastructure. There might be some things you can do encrypting the information before, before it goes in a SaaS provider. But essentially, that's just the big thing. Understand the layers, understand it's a mashup, understand the shared responsibility in those different areas, and then use your resources appropriately inside of your security program to very quickly do the assessment and the triage on the SaaS applications, and then be very careful and implement you know, strong technical controls on the infrastructure side. And to really do all this, it's it's really about thinking very virtually about the world and understand that your information and this technology can exist in a lot of different dimensions and planes. So think very virtually. I'll turn that back to Sean now. Thanks, Jim. So, you know, with this context that Jim's provided us, uh, one of the things that we, should think about when we're talking about data security in the cloud. It's, I think we've kind of beat to death a little bit the uh, this concept of yes, it's important to engage with the CSP. Uh, you got to force conversations, but again, um, Jim stated it best when he says, you know, the majority of this stuff still falls on us as a internal practitioners, irrespective of where the data uh, and what CSP it's residing on. So some of the things to consider as as we uh, rework our skill sets as uh, risk management professionals and, and cyber professionals is that th the focus is going to shift away from the traditional, um, hey, let's run the scan. Is this thing, you know, what's the status on that open compliance issue or let's get the IR stuff up and running. Um, it all has to change. And, um, you know, even something as simple as, simple as vulnerability management in the cloud context actually starts looking more like a different version of vendor management and quality management to ensure that they, uh, that if something is found, uh, that uh, indeed you're able to hold them uh, accountable for those types of things should it unfortunately ever lead uh, to a particular, uh, you know, negative outcome for your organization. So um, one of the key things that uh, Jim was also talking about is that the scope of this assurance, right? Which is, uh, it's really critical that when you're looking at the data elements across uh, SaaS and IaaS, that it's well understood where and how the roles and responsibilities really start and end. And this is where I think um, with regulations like uh, uh, GDPR, and if you're not familiar with the Cloud Security Alliance's uh, Code of Conduct, um, which is a document that's been uh, created by a global team um, in conjunction with a lot of the, uh, the leaders in this particular space privacy, that uh, that document in and of itself gives some excellent guidance around a lot of this. Uh, one of the challenges is that uh, even if you're able to tick the boxes from a controls perspective uh, at the CSP, there is still a lot uh, in terms of data flow and uh, ownership of data, uh, who who can or who cannot, that still falls on us as the practitioners that have responsibility. But understanding this, I think this will be some of the levers that um, can then be pulled uh, to effectuate change at these large CSPs uh, to try to address these things because the way it's kind of being done now isn't uh, terribly effective or efficient. Jim, is there something here else that you'd like to touch upon? Uh, no, I think you covered it pretty well. Same thing um, that uh, was being discussed before, which is what's really critical is that 
by understanding each one of these components and knowing where the responsibility resides, uh, and this is where it gets really uh, complicated, is when you start talking about data metadata, which traditionally would fall in the, the realm of the CSP, if you're not confident um, that data is being handled appropriately, or they haven't disclosed that perhaps that data is being uh, piped elsewhere. Uh, I knew of an organization that uh, found out that uh, their cloud service that they were consuming was actually um, not just someone from what Jim said earlier, was cobbled together from two or three different cloud services. And what they had done is created a front end for it. Well, that only was disclosed when uh, the contract theme phase came in. And in the contract, they stated, by the way, we have three other CSPs that are part of our service, but don't worry, we got it handled. Well, I don't know how well, uh, how comfortable everyone would be with that, but uh, the fact that it wasn't mentioned from the get-go, you know, um, there's a, a very well-known company that is known for making uh, very high-end cell phones uh, that some years ago, um, they have a consumer-based uh, cloud service that is used for storage for photos and everything like that. And uh, it was determined that actually their back end, even though it looks like from our uh, point of view, it looks like it's all theirs, is actually hosted on Google. And that we're talking, you know, top three fortune companies where even that's happening there. It's not because it's being done in any way of a malicious form. It's simply an effective modality for them to be able to deliver the, the high quality service that they want. But unless, uh, we as practitioners understand that or ask those questions. Um, don't expect that anyone's going to disclose it, uh, certainly from the get-go. So this comes back down to the concept of context, which is, uh, and it's really important, all of these standards that exist, PCI has been one of the most ineffective standards from a uh, cloud perspective. Um, if you even look at the standard itself, the first three controls are talking about an on-prem based architecture that is not really relevant to the cloud modality. What that means then is, if you're trying to take your control uh, and standards and compliance and just simply apply it over to cloud, it's gonna fail miserably because it, the way that everything gets done is completely different. And they don't have the context um, to actually include these things. Um, even 27001, which is still a great uh, international standard, had to create uh, outcropping standards, uh, for example, 27017, to really be able to uh, address the deficiencies that they were aware were in uh, the ISO standard because it was never intended to address cloud computing because it didn't exist back then. Um, that's why the CCM is such a critical component of uh, this tapestry that we have of risk management across the industry, because it was the first to market and is still the leading uh, standards and framework to get levels of measurement uh, across your CSPs, but also to look inward and ask the hard questions. And then just the last two things uh, that I'll leave you with is that, back to my comment about so much focus on what the CSP is or isn't doing, um, leaves a massive gap in terms of understanding how you apply and uh, work within that model. So let's say that you do have a data breach. If you were to say, uh, we had a data breach associated with a misconfigured S3 bucket, you as a practitioner, a stakeholder in this process, would you know what to do? My findings, this is empirical, and speaking from my experience, is most organizations are not ready for that. And the reason is, is because the detection process is totally different. Usually uh, SAS and IaaS uh, based deployments kind of reside within an LOB. So you may not have it feeding back into some sort of uh, system that you might have access to. But on top of which, you might not even have access to it to even be able to pull the information that's necessary. And worse off, um, in many cases, specifically in the case of IaaS, where you've got, uh, let's say, EC2 based Windows deployments for whatever reason running in this cloud and it, let's say it gets infected or you have a breach or something like that. Um, how will you handle the forensics on that? What's the process for that? And a lot of organizations are getting caught unprepared because they thought, oh, well, I'm, I'm just going to take my, uh, my, you know, guidance software or whatever else I've got. Uh, I'm going to image something and then I'm going to inspect it offline the way that I did it in the 90s in the last 20 years, right? Well, it doesn't work that way. Uh, I mean, even basic things like uh, being able to image forensically and bring it down 
uh, without any loss of integrity is a very difficult thing to do. So in terms of your data protection, it's really critical that we as practitioners look at this. And one of the key inputs for this is the Cloud Security Alliance's top threats. Uh, great document put together by some of the, the, the top minds in the uh, cloud security and risk management space that really call out a lot of the things that are uh, we already know uh, as practitioners, but it, it makes it a little bit difficult to articulate because it's kind of woven into everything else. It's a great resource that uh, helps uh, practitioners understand here, this, and it's backed by their data as well. Uh, really good resource if you haven't uh, uh, familiarized yourself with it. Jim, was there anything on the top threats that you may want to leave the teams here with? No, I think we might in, be into overtime. So I, Tara might give us the hook, but uh, it's a great document. Go check it out. A lot of free resources at CSA. Great. And yeah, guys, I think um, we're going to have to leave it there. Uh, unfortunately, I think that this is such an interesting topic. We could probably uh, continue to talk um, for a very long time about it. Um, but I'd like to thank you very much for, uh, for participating uh, today. And uh, I'd like to thank our audience members for joining us. I'm sorry that we couldn't get to all of the questions, um, but I would like to let you guys know that if you wanted to reach out to me, to my email address there, I uh, can try to get um, any and all additional questions answered. Uh, from these guys, and uh, or at least point you to uh, to appropriate resources. So um, here to help, and uh, thanks very much, everybody, again for joining us uh, for our latest Threat Post webinar. And thank you very much, Sean and Jim. Thank you. Thank you, thanks, everyone. Bye bye.